G'day, I'm Alan Giles, the Emergency Physician. Thanks for watching this Zoom PowerPoint presentation on a case of a patient that presents to the emergency department with what turns out to be an electrolyte abnormality. And it's working through the cause of that and treatment of the electrolyte abnormality. And this is a group of a few presentations looking at different electrolyte abnormalities. So let's get on with the case. This particular case is called Weakness. And it's a 64 year old gentleman. A slightly unusual story. He came in the morning pretty early on, looked unwell. He was a category two. And you can see that he had a recent virus. It was probably about two weeks ago, around Christmas. And since then, he's just got increasing general weakness, such that in the last couple of days, he's been you know, only able to walk in a wheelchair and he's getting some aches and pains in the legs. He looks unwell. But his numbers in terms of at triage aren't too bad. Um, he's got some hypertension. The desaturation, GCS, he's eight febrile, there's nothing else much to find. But they put him into the resource room where he was seen then by the CMO. And he said, look, he's had muscle pains for four or five days. He's had a recent uh, viral infection. But the last couple of days, he really can't walk at all. Uh, no fever, no rash, uh, no paraparesis, no weakness, no numbness, nothing like that. Does notice he's got some polyuria and polydipsia. His background to some hypertension and not that exciting. He's on a little bit of myocarditis and a lot of pain. His examination, again, is relatively unremarkable. He's dehydrated, he's afebrile, he's hypertensive. He's got some pain when you, when you sort of touch his, his muscles themselves. The reflexes are normal, so it's not as though he's got some transverse myelitis um, or an ascending myelopathy or something similar to that. Um, his GCS is 15. They do an ECG, which is not entirely normal. You can see this at the sinus rhythm, normal axis. Uh, but when you look at it, you can see that the QT is a bit prolonged. So it's more than half of the distance between the RR interval, more than half of that distance. And there's a U wave. You recall U waves are caused by a number of things. Hypercalcemia, we saw from a recent earlier um, talk, but also hypokalemia. So they've done a venous blood gas and that did in fact show significant um, hypokalemia and a metabolic alkalosis, that is there's a quite significant alkalosis and it's not a respiratory cause, they're not hyperventilating, it's they're holding that bicarbonate, so it's a metabolic cause and quite a lot of bicarbonate. So they did that, organized a few other bloods and then we're looking to get a senior to look at them. The bloods came back before the senior saw them and they confirmed that potassium was 2.1. The sodium was in the upper limit, or just above the top of normal. Uh, the creatinine, in fact, was normal. And the CK was elevated, not massively elevated, but 7,500 or so. Okay. So CMO, the ED physician, didn't add a whole lot more uh, for the examination, certainly. But they repeated the gas and it did show that it was getting slightly worse. This is now early afternoon. So they asked for some uh, review by general medicine and by renal. So they noticed, look, the severe hypokalemia, a metabolic alkalosis, and thought, you know, well, the sodium is a bit up and they were hypertensive. Maybe it's primary hypoaldosteronism or maybe we're seeing myositis. So let's give them some oral and intravenous potassium replacement, get ICU to look at them. They can do a polymyositis screen, which I'm not even sure what you do for that. ENAs, ANAs. I'm not too sure. Um, and see how they go from there. ICU said add some magnesium, nothing additional. General medicine did that autoimmune screen and said, well, let's do a CT of the abdomen because um, if they think they've got primary hyperaldosteronism, which we'll speak about a bit further, uh, they should look for adrenal mass, which is what Kuhn syndrome is. And they should get an aldosterone to renin ratio. Uh, neuro consult didn't really add too much. The renal team looked at it, they thought it was likely primary hyperaldosteronism because in, they said, look, the potassium that in the urine is high, and yet the potassium in the, in the serum is low, and the, the sodium is elevated. So they were convinced it was probably hyperaldosteronism. And this just shows that 
over time it did improve their potassium and that the sodium was actually quite high initially. The CT was performed and showed suggestive on the right adrenal gland of an adenoma. Okay. So <clears throat> they said, look, it's unilateral, so we think they're probably going to have to have an adrenalectomy on that side, uh, but we better do arterial uh, adrenal venous sampling first. So we've jumped a little bit. We've almost got like a diagnosis here of primary hyperaldosteronism, and I keep forgetting just the basics of how aldosterone works. Um, and we'll be looking at further because the osmosis.org have a video at the end which have included, which goes through all of all of um, primary hyperaldosteronism and a little bit on secondary hyperaldosteronism. Okay, so aldosterone is the hormone that acts on the distal tubular tubule and gets reabsorption of sodium with water, with that, and enhances secretion of the potassium and the H plus. So potassium and the H plus, that will mean that you'll get um, an, an alkalosis and hypokalemia. With the that loss of H plus, um, you will and they'll also they'll lose some chloride in the urine, they'll resorb bicarbonate. So you've got a metabolic alkalosis. So you have this hyponatremia, remember I said the sodium can resorb, hypokalemia, metabolic alkalosis, and hypertension. So that is the con syndrome triad. Hypertension, hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, caused by an adenoma, which makes aldosteronism. Aldosterone. The aldosterone uh, does a negative feedback on renin. So you have a high aldosterone, low renin ratio. You treat it by taking it out and you can check response to, and this shouldn't be aldosterone, it should um, be spironolactone before your OT uh, to see um, how it responds. So other causes of primary hyperaldosteronism? Well, the most common is overactive bilateral adrenals from adrenal hyperplasia. And then, and with Con syndrome, it's a common cause of secondary hypertension. Uh, how do they present? Well, they present much like this blood guy did, hypertensive, and there may be some signs because of hypertension. Uh, but the hypokalemia, if it's severe, is going to get the muscle pains and weakness, maybe palpitations, maybe even rarely go into torsades. But it's um, more to do with that cramping, headaches, constipation. He had actually had some polyuria and polydipsia, so he probably had nephrogenic diabetes insipidus caused by that low potassium. And of course, the hypertension. Okay, there is a DD, the only one from the novelty point of view, from my point of view, is just that excessive licorice ingestion by the way it stops cortisol going to cortisone in the kidneys can mimic this and can cause another cause of metabolic alkalosis. Um, why do you do adrenal vein sampling? One of the reasons is that you can't be sure, especially with bilateral um, changes on a CT, whether it's just an incidental oma rather than the true cause. So they try and get adrenal vein sampling. Uh, this is what a, it looks like on a CT. There's an, an adrenal mass, and I've just cut down just below that by one to see it's on the top of that kidney there. Okay. So this is a, a, an unusual, we don't see that many patients like this that come in with hypertension, hypokalemia, hyponatremia, um, and metabolic alkalosis who has Crohn syndrome. So now this is um, about a 10 minute video, maybe a little bit less than that, by osmosis.org. Um, and it's certainly worth a look just to reinforce um, what we're seeing now. What my concern before was that you wouldn't be able to hear it. So I'm just going to stop sharing for a second. Do that and make sure that you have the sound that you can hear. And then we'll go from there. And I do hope this works. I'll be able to hear it if no one else does. Hyperaldosteronism refers to an endocrine disorder where the adrenal gland produces above normal levels of the hormone aldosterone. Now there are two adrenal glands, one above each kidney.
And each one has an inner layer called the medulla and an outer layer called the cortex, which is subdivided into three more layers, the zona glomerulosa, the zona fasciculata, and the zona reticularis. The outermost layer is the zona glomerulosa, and it's full of cells that make the hormone aldosterone. Aldosterone is part of a hormone family, or axis, which work together and are called the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. Together, these hormones decrease potassium levels, increase sodium levels, and increase blood volume and blood pressure. Aldosterone is secreted in response to elevated levels of renin, and its role is to bind to receptors on two types of cells along the distal convoluted tubule of the nephron. First, it stimulates the sodium-potassium ion pumps of the principal cells to work even harder. These pumps drive potassium from the blood into the cells, and from there it flows down its concentration gradient into the tubule to be excreted as urine. At the same time, the pumps drive sodium in the opposite direction from the cell into the blood, which allows more sodium to flow from the tubule into the cell, down its concentration gradient. Since water often flows with sodium through a process of osmosis, water also moves into the blood, which increases blood volume and therefore blood pressure. The other function of aldosterone is to stimulate the proton ATPase pumps in alpha intercalated cells, which causes more protons to get excreted into the urine. Meanwhile, ion exchangers on the basal surface of the cell move the negatively charged bicarbonate ion into the extracellular space causing an increase in pH. Hyperaldosteronism can happen due to primary causes, which is where the adrenal gland itself is responsible for the excess production of aldosterone. The most common primary cause is called idiopathic hyperaldosteronism, because the zona glomerulosa has an increase in the number of cells secreting aldosterone, but it's not really clear why this happens. The second most common cause is called Kahn syndrome, and this is where an adenoma, or tumor in the glandular epithelial cells, secrete too much aldosterone. A third cause is familial hyperaldosteronism, and this is a genetic condition that runs in families. And it's where the zona glomerulosa cells inappropriately make aldosterone in response to adrenocorticotropic hormone, which is secreted by the pituitary gland. And this is in addition to responding to renin as normal. Hyperaldosteronism can also be due to secondary causes, where the pathology lies outside the adrenal gland. Secondary causes of hyperaldosteronism are usually due to excess aldosterone production in response to high levels of renin. This might happen when there's a chronic decrease in blood pressure, like in congestive heart failure or cirrhosis. Hyperaldosteronism leads to hypokalemia, which is low potassium levels in the blood as well as hypernatremia, high sodium levels in the blood. With more sodium around in the blood, water moves into the blood vessels, which results in a high blood volume and high blood pressure, or hypertension. Finally, the loss of protons also results in an alkalosis, and more specifically, a metabolic alkalosis, since it's caused by the kidneys. Individuals with hyperaldosteronism typically develop hypertension-related symptoms, like headaches and facial flushing as well as hypokalemia-related symptoms, like constipation, weakness, and potentially changes in their heart rhythm. The diagnosis of hyperaldosteronism is mainly done by measuring levels of renin and aldosterone. In primary hyperaldosteronism, the main problem is that the zona glomerulosa cells secrete high levels of aldosterone, and that aldosterone has a negative feedback effect on renin, and so it actually inhibits renin production. So in this case, aldosterone levels are high and renin levels are low. In secondary hyperaldosteronism, on the other hand, the main problem is that there's too much renin produced by the juxtaglomerular cells of the kidneys. So even though aldosterone is inhibiting renin secretion, renin production is still being stimulated by those cells. And this means that there's both high levels of aldosterone and high levels of renin. Treatment of hyperaldosteronism is usually with potassium-sparing diuretics, especially spironolactone, which competitively binds to aldosterone receptors on the principal and alpha intercalated cells. With these medications around, aldosterone can't exert its effects. 
Additionally, treating the underlying cause can also be helpful. For example, in Kahn syndrome, surgical removal of the tumor can help. And also managing heart failure and cirrhosis. All right, as a quick recap, hyperaldosteronism is the chronic excess secretion of aldosterone from the zona glomerulosa cells of the adrenal gland. And these high aldosterone levels can lead to hypokalemia, hypernatremia, hypertension, and a metabolic alkalosis. Thanks for watching. Thank you, Osmosis Dolan, for doing that. Always a good overview. Okay, well, that'll do for this uh, particular look at electrolyte abnormality. Thanks for watching, and I hope we share another time again soon. Cheers.